welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jung Won Kim. I am uh, the new, um, the newest member, one of the newest members of the Slow Factory. I joined just this month as a, a part of the Leadership Collective, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be hosting um, Open Edu Summer Camp. It's the very first time that I've actually hosted. I have participated in many classes. I've taught one class, and I've made a guest appearance in one of Celine's classes, but this is um, really, really exciting for me to be able to host a class and to introduce uh, a very dear sister friend and eternal inspiration, Celine Saman. She is the uh, co-founder of Slow Factory. She is a, a designer who comes out of MIT Media Lab. She is a thought leader in the uh, sustainability and um, supply chain, fashion supply chain um, space. She has really brought the conversation around sustainability, around labor exploitation, human rights, and climate justice. Um, to the fashion sector and to the fashion conversation. So um, I think we all recognize Celine's incredible thought leadership in this space. And today she's here to teach a class about the culture of disposability brought to you by Open EDU and the Slow Factory in partnership with Vestiaire. Please check out Vestiaire. They're doing incredible work as well in transforming our relationship to fashion and to things. Um, and without further ado, I would like to, or adieu, I'm sorry, not adieu, without further ado, I would like to introduce Celine, who really doesn't need an introduction, um, and welcome everyone to our class. Thank you so much. So apologies, it's a laundry day over here, so I have a pile of clothes behind me <laughs> that awaits me to um, fold. Um, Thank you everyone for being here, for being part of Open Education. Thank you, Jenny and Jen, our American Sign Language interpreters. And thank you so much for Nick to, uh, from our team for uh, organizing all this. Ah, deep breath. Thank you so much also for Vestier Collective for you know allowing us to empowering us, let's say, to provide a wonderful program this summer, Open EDU Summer Camp. It's a first. Uh, we are uh, getting ready to launch open education in the fall. We have an exciting program this fall. We are also fundraising to support an open EDU kids this summer, uh, this fall, sorry. So if you find these things interesting and if you've learned so much through open education, we would love your financial support. It could be a small monthly donation of uh, $5 or under. This allows us to really power through these programs and to build and continue to expand on open education. And our goal for the fall is to extend this program for children. So Open EDU Kids is something we're working on uh, behind the scenes that we would love to see come to light. And we, um, we ask our community to support us if they find this interesting and if they want to see a program like this for children. Of course, we're not going to be talking about difficult, difficult topics, but as you know, climate justice and human rights, social justice are topics that children are already hearing and understanding. So these things will provide them a lot of stability and clarity. And I know so from just talking to my own children about these difficult topics that they are overhearing. And they're not just difficult topics because they're overhearing them and some of them are living them. So it's important to really remove the, the, the stigma of shame and the all these barriers to knowledge and to really start young and talking about these topics. So Open ETU Kids is a very cool program we wanna work on for the fall. Now, <laughs> enough self-promotion, let's talk about disposability. So for those of you who may know me or have taken my classes in the past, uh, I'd say a lot of times that sustainability is a culture. It's not something you buy. It's how you think, how you live your life, but also what you believe, what are your values. And those are the things that allow us to define what is sustainable in our lives, in our environment, in our systems. And oftentimes when we're invited to go behind the scenes with brands to help them define their sustainability strategy, their climate programs, 
you know, we start by asking them, how do you define sustainability? And if it's not already part of their co core culture, it's very hard to add on a program about sustainability if it's not a shared value overall in the organization. So similarly to that, disposability and our idea to dispose of things comes from culture, comes from how we relate to our uh, our objects. Where did this come from? Because you know, if we look at first of all ancient knowledge, indigenous uh, cultures around the world, not just in North America, people from the global majority don't approach disposability in the same way. This is not a comparison to make people feel good or bad about their relationship to garbage, but this is about understanding where this cultural moment happened, how did it stick and how did it go global in such a way that it caught on and it became the norm. It became acceptable. And um, I don't have the book around me, but it is somewhere near my bed. But part of open education this uh, fall, we have a book club that we are starting. So we're going to also talk about that and how this book relates to everything we're talking about. So the culture of disposability. We're going to talk about this through five chapters. First chapter is PR, how PR started, public relations. PR is basically what runs the fashion industry, if you know. If you don't have a PR and you run a brand, you can't really get your brand to be known by anybody unless you really have a strong social media presence. And even then, it's really hard to get that brand in the hands of these influencers, these celebrities, the press, it all starts with PR and our relationship to objects and to brands. Do I like this brand? Do I not like, do I trust this brand? And PR plays a tremendous role in that. And why do we start with PR? I'm going to explain. And then we're going to talk about how information and PR and the usage of PR as a tool leads action. Okay, leads us into action, leads us into influences how we purchase, how we discard, how we trust, how we fear. And we are very vulnerable to this information or control of information. And that's why Slow Factory works specifically in information, in translating complex information, in bringing information and making it accessible to people as much as possible, destigmatizing removing the barriers of academia so that we can understand and we can level up on the same levels of what is happening. How, how are we engaging with all of these things? Then we're going to dive into sustainability as a culture, which is something we talked about a lot here at the Soul Factory and how disposability is a form of colonialism and how that impacts the system and it's a systemic issue and how do we address a systemic issue? We have to learn how to think in systems. So if you know all this already, it's a great, it's a great catch up, it's a great reminder. It's, it's okay to listen to things that you've already known because it triggers something like, a, it, it, it builds confidence, it's confidence building into your existing knowledge. And if you didn't know any of this, this is a great way to start your journey into diving deeper into this type of knowledge. So OpenEDU, it's a great introduction. It's a great way to get you guys into it. If you already know it, it builds confidence into your knowledge, into your existing knowledge. And as you share these things that we are providing, please keep in mind that Slow Factory Foundation and OpenEDU is under Creative Commons with a specific license that allows you to share but it's not allowing uh, commercial use. So that means you cannot sell the content, okay? It is what it is, that's where we're at today. We allow people to share, but you have to uh, state your sources as we do and attribute the work as we do and continue building this chain of information that is far more solid than plagiarism and stealing each other's content. So without furthering, further delays, let's dive into this PR conversation. 
the power of public relations in changing culture and changing how we relate. So after the class, I'm going to give you a series of resources, videos, lectures, podcasts, books, texts to read, to dive deeper into what I'm telling you. But this is a great summary of everything that we're going to look into. So the father, sadly, it is a white man, behind <laughs> PR is Sigmund Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. And in the sources that I'm gonna share with you, there is a video, a film on YouTube that talks about Edward Bernays and, and his genius, let's say, in bridging the gap between psychoanalysis and what Freud, his uncle, had discovered around our instinct, our sexual desires, uh, defining the realm of our psychoanalysis and connecting that to influencing and manipulating the masses, manipulating the masses uh, as a form of diplomacy. And we're gonna look deeper into that, manipulating the masses in how we are uh, collectively building our culture around our values. But he basically popularized this idea of buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. And this is a quote from Fight Club. A lot of you on social media were like, it's Fight Club. Yes, it's Fight Club. But it's, it is inspired by Edward Bernays' work in manipulating, let's say, the information, the usage of imagery, of what images connote in order for the, the culture to change in adopting certain products and adopting them at scale. And what, what uh, oh, one more thing. It's, he calls this the engineering of consent. It's the basis of propaganda, okay? And this was before World War II. Um, so as he was building these ideas, Sigmund Freud was still in Europe and he was uh, losing a lot of money. He wasn't respected for his ideas because he was saying essentially that all we think about is sex okay and at the time that was not something that the masses were ready to understand and colonial power had already expanded tremendously this was in the beginning of the 1900s so much so that austerity was what ruled culture okay through austerity through a manipulative uh, notion of christianity colonial power expanded and controlled the masses. So when someone like Freud came in and said, all we think about is sex, sexuality, we are sexual beings, that was something that was not well welcomed yet, at least not in Europe. But what Edward Bernays saw is that our mind, our, our um, desires could be manipulated and controlled into pacifying the masses. So let's look into that. And I will read this quote. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. And this guy was so powerful that he wasn't just hired by brands, he was hired by governments to basically manipulate this whole idea around war and peace and influencing the American public into adopting certain values. So we're gonna dive deeper into this through a fun example and less fun examples. In other words, consuming goods makes the public less likely to rebel. Consumerism as part of the capitalist identity is a diplomatic strategy, if you will, that creates a way for the masses to follow their desires or have a certain feeling of control over their desires by purchasing and concretizing their desires. And we're gonna look into that and how that pacifies the masses. It creates a sense of peace. It creates a sense of self-control. 
he wrote many books, okay? And he popularized a lot of concepts, uh, crystallizing public opinion. I think the other one is The Consuming Self is another book that he wrote. Um, and basically stimulating people's selfish desires with produced, uh, with produced goods, sorry, makes them more docile. Public relations became a powerful tool for polit political control of the masses. So he wasn't just working with brands, as I said, he was also working with governments. And how he was able to do so was using information as his canvas, as, as, as his... Uh, it, yeah, as his canvas, essentially, to creating the kind of motion through society that he wanted to create. Information is a powerful tool. Throughout our history, our civilization, control happened when we controlled information. So there's, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but through, I mean, probably you do, because that's like basically what um, the colonial system teaches voluntarily is that before we reached a uh, majority of literacy amongst the population, the control of information was what people, uh, was how governments and the monarchy and imperialism functioned. And as the press expanded and people learned how to read and write, information became a little bit more complex and fluid. And so other techniques and other methods appeared in this control of information. And with the beginning of the internet, the information age, information became far more accessible. But information does not mean knowledge, right? Information is out there, does not mean you understand it. It's how you are able to understand it and the time you are able to spend. And that's a luxury that most of us don't have time to spend on really understanding information. So what we rely on mostly, it's this, meme culture today and back in the day ads so it's all kind of connected between the ads and how we manipulate visuals and information to now this um meme warfare that we are a part of that polarizes america polarizes the world through the usage of images and words so let's look into what this guy did, okay? Consumption of goods replaces a sense of self-worth and also creates a sense of status, okay? Because right now we are existing within a colonial construct of predefined notions of status. And the way that disposability grew and grew in popularity and in adoption was because of this collective desire to reach a certain status, a status of ease, a status of comfort. And Bernays found that it was possible to persuade people to behave irrationally if products are linked to their personal emotions, desires, and feelings. So there's the self, there's my desire, and there's the status I would like to achieve. And through information, he worked through the desires so that they can the mass can shift into a status, a perceived status, of course, through the purchasing of products. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A. I cannot see your chats, I'm so sorry, and I cannot see your questions just yet, but I will get to them at the end of this talk. So what is culture and how does it form itself? How do we create culture? So this is, of course, the pictograms that I've used are of, you know, of course, very American centered, the culture of war, the culture of laws, the culture of beliefs as we appropriate everything else from around the world. Um, and when I say we, I say the American um, mainstream culture that is a dominant culture that whether or not we want to, we are bombarded by it, okay? Even if I live in Lebanon, even if I live in anywhere else in the world, I know America. America is all over the world, but, but America doesn't know me. America doesn't know our culture because we don't have the same um, access, access to broadcast. And we also, when we do broadcast, we have to code switch to speak in a certain way that America would understand us. So there's a misunderstanding here of 
the rest of the world in terms of culture, but the, all the world can agree on understanding American culture because American culture made itself very, very dominant and very accessible as a uh, extension of its colonial empire around the world, besides the 800 military um, bases. Going back to Edward Bernays, okay, so at the time, just quickly talking about the adoption of cigarettes and how women became uh, smokers. <laughs> Some people say in the popular culture is because the cigarette was uh, advertised as something that makes you slimmer, but in fact, it's not true. So before women were not allowed to smoke because the cigarette symbolized the phallus. It looked like you put your a phallus in your mouth. But, but the way that Bernays changed the conversation was this idea of freedom, of ownership, of women acting as men, and of a sense of ownership around uh, their own bodies. And so he staged a public protest where he had suffragettes light up cigarettes in the middle of a public demonstration all at the same time. He brought in the press and he made everybody see that smoking was a powerful act. It looked like torches of freedom. So he, he created a way for people to really understand that this was like the Statue of Liberty. This was a, a form of freedom, a form of ownership over one's body. But he, he basically sold everyone cancer. <laughs> so it, this, is the, this is how manipulation of information, of public uh, interest happened and occurred, and the usage of press the usage of media, the, the power of PR essentially in everything that we adopt. And this is a cigarette, but you can understand this could be a shoe, this could be makeup, this could be your, your foundation, your thing for your pimple, your mascara, your hair product, your, brightening your teeth, slimming your waist, all of it, all of it. This is the basis of all of this type of adoption of in our culture, of how we were able to, again, in the beginning when I showed you um, this of going into a status, a certain reach for a status. So again, so through the cigarette, he staged his whole performance art, <laughs> got the press involved and got these women to smoke and this idea of freedom. And that's how irrelevant objects can become powerful in building the narrative of how we want to be seen by others. So of course, now I'm talking about the Gillette uh, razor, because this was through my research. And again, if you want to contradict, that's all okay. But through my research, I found that this was the first product that was advertised as disposable. The blades, instead of being sharpened and treated and taken care of, you could just toss them. You could just throw away those blades, buy another pack, replace them and shave. And this was both for men and women, because women also shave. It was advertised more mainly for guys, but it was also used by the female, by women and whoever identify as a woman. But the idea was to remove hair. So this was the first product that I found was, um, and this is the patent of how they basically baked into the product this idea of disposability. So instead of taking care of the blades, you can just toss them away, it's easy. And that's when we're gonna explore how sustainability is a culture, how influencing this idea of sustainability must come through this understanding that it, it, it has to be a part of our culture. It's not gonna be through the shaming and the blaming and the doom and gloom. It has to be inspirational. It has to inspire change. So just going back to the Gillette blade was designed to be thrown away when it got blunt. It was an alternative to the straight razor that had to be regularly sharpened and was meant to last a lifetime. So we're moving away from this idea of lasting a lifetime that was coming becoming too much part of the past. And we're gonna see why. The Gillette blade disrupted an existing practice of reuse, generated new shaving and waste habits and established the principles of a disposable economy, driven by high volume sales of a relatively cheap item designed for limited use, discarding, and then replacement. 
so far, how are we doing? Maybe I drink from my disposable canette of uh, my can. <laughs> but foil is infinitely recyclable. Just saying. Um, <laughs> so before you start shaming me, oh, gotta inspire me. Ah, la, 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 la. Okay. So the idea of how it was introduced into culture, of course, it was through desire, through save your skin. The other one was not so safe because it, when it becomes blunt and you'd care for it, it would cut you as by the new blade will not cut you. So this whole idea of safety, of hygiene, um, and the power of marketing. Marketing builds an emotional connection to products and ties that connection to new habits, building a new culture of functionality, ease, comfort, and prosperity. And Bernays, Eddie Bernays, Edward Bernays, shifted the culture from need to desire. That was a very key moment throughout the 1920s because before that, the culture was, I buy what I need. But now very few of us do that. We buy what we want, okay? We buy what we desire. That's, we were born into this culture. Our grandparents, there are few generations that separates us from buying what you need. Right now we are born into this idea of I buy whatever I want. So people would shop for what they wanted instead of what they needed. And thanks to Freud, he understood what motivated the human mind. Again, sex, being sexy, being, desired, desirability, and all of that stuff. And he also championed product placement. So he was, his clients were the brands, his clients were the magazines, and his clients were also the music industry and the, the, the film industry. So he was connecting everybody and he became so, so, so rich. He lived in, um, the biggest fanciest hotels in Manhattan through the biggest parties. He knew the mayor, he knew everybody, this guy. And he started to plug these products of beauty, of cars. I don't know if I have the, the, the image later, but he really shifted culture from citizens to consumers. And that is what I mean with this diplomatic move, how the colonial empire of capitalism change this culture from citizen feeling like you're part of the democracy to you're just part of the economy. And then plastic appeared. Plastic, plastic, plastic. Okay, so in another class, if you missed it, uh, material scientist Dr. Theon Shiro's taught the uh, history of plastic, which I really recommend. If you have not watched it, please do because she really dives into how it started from a Petri dish and entered the fashion industry very quickly because it was all about the nylon and the stockings and so on and so forth and how the stocking were to stick on the skin because they were falling, they were made of silk and so on and so forth. And this idea of it happened at a very opportunistic time in history when already culture had been shifting through this idea after World War II of scarcity and pain through ease and, and comfort and abundance and just buying and throwing things. And this idea of we're, we're growing, we're getting out of poverty. There was a boom economically. And plastic, uh, basically she says, Dr. Athean Shiros, that it's not a bad idea. Plastic is a durable material that has a lot of positive properties, but it's how we use plastic that is problematic because we are tossing a very durable material that does not decompose. So mainstream culture, uh, mainstream American culture, but as I explained earlier, a dominant culture worldwide, whether you are living in America or not, you know America. You know American culture, you know the slang, you know the songs, you know the artists, you know the movies, you know what America loves, what America thinks, everything. America is has its empire through media and oppresses the whole world through imagery, sound, everything. Okay, so we know America. 
So we can say that mainstream American culture is a global culture. And already it was shifting in values and it was changing as I was saying. And culture also started to shift from collectivism after World War II to hyper individualism, focusing not only on surviving and but on thriving, on desiring, on building this American dream TM that was sold to us, that continues to impact us. We were born the kids of the 80s and 90s and 70s and 2000s. We are born into this, this idea of in hyper individualism and building this American dream, this ease, this comfort, the status of the oppressor. So the rise of disposability was very much built on this idea of cheap, fast, immediacy, and hygienic, but also a carefree, easy. It had to be uh, sold as prosperity, as comfort. You don't have to wash it. Throw it away. Go get your nails done instead. Freedom, women, all that stuff. Comfort, carefree, ease. So even ads like these where grab your empty bottles and look like this. And also she's a brunette. You look at the, the body language, who she is, what she is representing, or be a cute blondie who's just going to throw this in the garbage. Look at how many straws she's throwing in the garbage, lol. Um, <laughs> or toss them away and live a carefree life. Carefree, TM, trademark, that's fundamental in American culture, fundamental. You don't want to care. Not caring, not thinking, it's freedom. It's fundamental to the idea of freedom in America, under colonial, like this is what colonialism wants. Imperialist, colonialist, so disposability. Disposability is culture, it's part of our culture part of this carefree ease. So the, the future after World War II was about ease, disposable and ease, and we have so much of it. And it was a class aspiration of not doing menial tasks. So it was, again, this idea of aspiration of this status that you don't have to work that hard. Again, it's all an illusion because we work twice as hard under capitalism <laughs> to get so, so little. So it was this idea of freedom, of status, success, superiority, class, all of these notions that are fundamental in white supremacist colonial entity and structure. But the future of plastic is in the trash can. That quote really, really fundamentally changed how plastic was used. And that was part of, a, I think, in 19th something 20, 40, I, I included that as part of your uh, uh, resources after class. It's a whole study on the Society of Plastic Industry. They got together, they did a few conferences and they really realized that the future of plastic is in the trash can. As fast as you can toss it, as more we can make money because it's a cheap, durable, easy. And they already started controlling the Gulf region, the Middle East to really take a hold on oil. So all of our region in the Middle East is at the service of the global empire to provide cheap oil. Meanwhile, we don't have any. So that's fine. Uh, plastic materialized disposability. And Dr. Max Lee Boiron, who is uh, an incredible thinker and First Nation uh, thinker around plastic pollution, two pieces I'm gonna include into the resources after this class. One is the book that we are including as part of the book club for the fall. And two is a piece that she wrote, uh, two pieces that she wrote, one for Teen Vogue on plastic colonialism and another one on, um, you, you'll see it's included into the, the resources. But in, in their book, Pollution is Colonialism, Colonialism refers to a system of domination that grants a colonizer access to land for the colonizer's goals. So what we're seeing here is a landfill, okay? Landfills, 
And if you want to attend one of our wasteland design classes, again, they're available on OpenEDU. You can also look into on the website Landfills as Museums, which is an open learning program that we do at the Slow Factory, where we take designers to landfills. We walk on these piles and piles of trash that we've probably contributed in tossing in the morning, a yogurt, a toothbrush, a razor, hygiene, hy women's hygiene products, bras, socks, shoes, clothes, everything is in there. And we talk about the anatomy of the landfill. So that's in that class. And we are reviving that program. It was on hold during COVID because uh, waste management in America is considered part of the first uh, responders uh, to COVID and they got a lot of COVID cases. So we're going to revive that program when it's safer. But for now, you can access the, uh, the whole learning uh, and findings online. But that's, that's like a landfill from space, okay? Satellite image of a landfill. A landfill is only possible when the land is colonized and used as either a resource of extraction or a resource of basically burying our uh, future archeological finds of our civilization. So that's the mandatory reading for the fall. We're so excited. If you want to purchase it, there is a discount code that gives you 40% because it's part of the Slow Factory. So join our Slack. It's going to be in our newsletter. If you want to buy this book, we are sending you directly to the uh, publishers. And we've worked with them to get you all a discount code. Super cool. So governments have a permission to pollute via a system established to identify what is an acceptable amount of toxicity in the environment and the water. This is an, extra, uh, uh, an excerpt from the book. Permission to pollute looks like, according to the Canadian federal regulations, 0 0.010 milligram of arsenic per liter of drinking water is acceptable, but 0 0.011 is too much. The maximum acceptable concentration for lead in tap water is 0.005 milligram per liter. Under the permission to pollute system, specific quantities of contaminants are allowed legally in bodies of water, human bodies, air, food, and environments. And that includes also your sunscreens. Most of your sunscreens contain plastic, microplastics, and they are sold as sustainable when they're not just so you know. This way of governing pollution is relatively new, but it is premised on an old colonial system of land relations where the land is a resource with a capital R. Dr. Max Liboron, this is part of the book. I'm going to read it together. It's going to be really fun. Time check. Okay, perfect. So now we understand that it is about, it's a systemic issue. It's, it's part of culture, yes. But it is a systemic issue. It really is part of a larger system that benefits the economy and benefits our governments. So for systemic issues to be resolved, we have to start thinking in systems. And we are not trained to do so. Because in our traditional educational system, it serves the colonial power. It creates good soldiers. It creates good workers where you listen to your boss, you don't think too much, you don't talk too much, and you obey. You know specifically how to do something, but you don't understand it as a whole because we shame this idea of jacks of all trades. But a designer is a really, really powerful player in society. That's what I deeply believe, not because I'm a designer, but because I really think that everything is by design. It was designed this way. It wasn't an accident. So as a designer, we are trained to think macro, big picture, and micro. Hyper interaction, super tiny little, basically the space between T and H as you are designing a poster, all the way to the big picture of the poster and where that poster lives in culture and when that culture lives in society and who likes that culture, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're trained to go from macro to micro very, very easily without getting super dizzy. Yep, that's my special power. 
<laughs> so thinking in systems. This is just like a very vulgar system <laughs> that I created where I just wanted to take a look at this together, where it's basically a linear system. As you know, it's a linear system, okay? At Slow Factory, we tried to bend that arrow into a circle and it was so hard, we literally broke our backs. So we started to look at, okay, how can we affect change? How can we affect change? In the economy, green capitalism, not interested. In the government through policy, maybe let's play with that idea in culture through information yes we can do that that's what we do through creating a production line a better production line between removing this idea of extraction extracting yes we can affect that here we can work here through consumption and changing the way we can yes we can okay we can do that here through waste by working with waste management yes we can do that here through landfills, yes, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is a way for you to position yourself, okay? Because a lot of times I hear, oh my God, open easy you, I don't know what to do. I'm depressed, I agree, but I don't know what to do. And, and, and I want, we want, we wanna figure out a way to do things because through action, we really have a healthier relationship to this traumatic situation, yeah that we are involved in. So through action, through, through um, applied knowledge, that's what we deeply believe in. So that's basically what we um, wanna talk about. So I don't have this solution, so sadly, I don't know, but I have techniques, methodologies, and I wanna open up the conversation to you all. In your opinion, how do we effectively change culture in 2022? And is changing culture enough in today's landscape? How do we effectively suggest a better system design? And on that note, I um, would love to open up the conversation and hear your thoughts because that's better this way. Thank you, Celine. That was such an informative lecture, very wide ranging and specific at the same time. Um, I learned a lot and I can tell from the chat that um, people are abuzz um, and integrating all of this new information. We have lots of questions popping up in the Q&A and quite a few on the chat too. I wanna remind everyone, if you have a question and you put it in the chat, um, it, the chat is so busy that it's hard to find the questions in there. So please copy paste it into the Q&A um, box instead. Um, we have so many really interesting questions, but I wanna start off with a really provocative question from Yuhei Ogawa. Could propaganda be a good thing if it's used as a tool to put out a positive scientific message for example, about climate change, or do you think there's just a fundamental problem with using propaganda at all as a method to achieve something? So super interesting ethical question from Yuhei. Thank you, Yuhei, what a great question. I, I, I love the provocative questions. I love to disagree and have lots of fights. So if you want, join me. I'm Lebanese. I am very much at ease with confrontation. So I love that. It's very, very potent for our mind to expand and to think. So on that note, propaganda inherently, it's a manipulation, okay? It's a manipulation of information and it's a manipulation of the truth. So in progressive circles, propaganda is not seen as something that is acceptable for us to engage in. But sadly, okay, we exist within a system that uses misinformation as a tool to manipulate the masses, whether it's about the COVID-19 vaccine or whether it's about climate, uh, um, climate chaos, climate injustices. It took so many years for us to achieve this level of mainstream understanding that climate change is actually occurring and that we need to, to, to address it immediately. Had we used propaganda, would, be, would we be further? Or would we be also contributing in this polarization? Right now, this is a question that I personally don't have an answer for. On the one hand, there are think tanks that are being heavily funded by the right-wing um, 
uh, government to spread misinformation. They receive hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? And they use all of our channels, Twitter, Instagram, the news uh, as pundits on, on, on TV and so on. And they have a big reach and a big access to spread misinformation. Does that mean that the progressive groups must be as equipped in terms of manipulating information and engaging in propaganda? That is an ethical question that honestly delays progress in such a way. I have no answer. I don't know. John Juan, what do you think? I have no idea how to answer this question. I know. I, I think it's a really, really important ethical question. And I think at this stage in our climate crisis, we do not have the luxury of really um, taking all of this into account because I, I think we have to um, we have to use all of the means necessary to share information and change our culture. Can we engage in uh, propaganda in a more ethical way? Maybe that is the question. Is there a way that we can, you know, um, create propaganda and be transparent about the fact that, you know, our goal explicitly is to change culture? Maybe that's a way that we can approach it and say we are out here trying to change the culture of consumption and trying to change the culture of investing and trying to change the culture of fashion and food and all of those things. Um, and just be open about it. Maybe that's one way around it, but I don't, I don't think we can afford not to do it. Um, so the, here's another question from um, uh, one of our students that is a little bit in the similar vein, another sort of ethical question, which is, um, do you think pursuing formal education, like going to universities for degrees and certificate programs, does that give people knowledge um, or does it kind of acculturate people into a system of consumerism and status and um, kind of bring people into the mainstream culture instead of thinking freely and act, acting freely? So this is a question about, is education really just a process of acculturation and propaganda, to put it bluntly? Oh my gosh, I love our community. Our community is so on top of everything. Um, you know, how can I say? Um, there is no, a, there is not a yes, no answer to this question, right? I cannot say yes, no, yes, no, no. There is not, it depends, it depends. And as a designer, it depends is one of my favorite, favorite answers because it fucking depends, okay? We cannot tell you a very standardized answer because that doesn't exist as you know. So. Sometimes it's good to go into deep education and higher ranks of education in order to affect change internally. That change is slow. Those seeds don't, la don't live very long. They require a lot of energy, but it's possible. Okay, and we've seen that through history that it was possible and not only possible, it was necessary to take that road. But there are many, many roads that lead us to progress. It's not just through the traditional educational system. That's why we deeply believe in what we do here at the Slow Factory through open education. We really see this as a revolutionary uh, contribution to our collective uh, uh, you know, and popular culture to be able to remove this academic barrier through very complex things. We want to discuss philosophy, we want to discuss econ economy, we want to discuss you know, system design in a context that's outside of, its, of the institution. And also the institution is slow, it's old, and it's, it's very hard to reform, very, very hard to reform because inherently it was designed by uh, colonial powers to extend its power on the masses for generations and generations to come. So inherently, it's not our friend, okay? Inherently, it's not part of our future. Is there a part of the future in education that we would like to keep? I think so, yes, definitely. I'm a big fan of discipline, positive discipline, okay? I'm a big fan of these certain things, yes. And of course, I have to bring it back to my identity as a Lebanese person. We deeply believe in education. Education, it's a passport for us, okay? Our passport is shit. Language is a passport. Education is a passport. And our parents 
They pay for our education with our, their blood, sweat, and tears because that's the only thing we have when we are able to do something with our lives in the world. So education, it's fundamentally part of the progress that we're looking for. Is it only in academia? No. And what we are building here is this confidence that it exists outside of colonial institutions and it is valid and it is important. So that's what I, I, I must say. Yeah, really important um, distinction that you've made between education and academic institution. Traditionally, education happens in so many different ways. And although I think many people from the global majority are infiltrating academic institutions and trying to change them and applying uh, you know, critical race theory, for example, um, anti-colonial perspectives and so on, those institutions were created, you know, largely by, as someone in the chat said, you know, people who are pale, male, and stale. I love that, um, by the way. So the people who are trying to change it from the inside really have to fight this exhausting battle against the system that's created. So one of the things about open education is it's a really interesting uh, workaround, a design workaround to um, provide education without sort of dealing with all of these institutional barriers. Um, going back to the question of propaganda, though, someone uh, put in the chat, I happen to just catch it, another really interesting question, which is, uh, why would we even call, um, you know, messaging to change culture using facts? Why would that even be called propaganda? That's, a, I guess the, the point is really that's not propaganda because it's based on factual information. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah. In the New York Times, I think, or in the Atlantic regarding facts, okay? Facts, they can be facts, they could be true. They're not gonna change people's minds, okay? To change people's minds, you have to hit them with emotion. Just how we are, this is how we are as a human being. You can give me a fact that is, scientifically proven and it's not just it's not me actually I, I am very much pro facts and data but <laughs> not everyone's like that but I'm just saying that culturally it won't change people's minds so in the in regards of COVID okay in regards of the vaccine okay simple things am I gonna say I'm a <laughs> pro vaccine and go get vaccinated blah 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 I didn't use any social channel to talk about this because it's a very complex issue and I understand both mindset but in in this context regarding covid we can have all the facts okay it's an emotional response it's about our life it's about our safety similarly with climate change we can have all the facts we've had the facts we've positioned these facts into the news okay we didn't have a lot of bandwidth in the media that's true it was buried information that's true but it was there so facts versus emotion emotion wins so that's why propaganda plays on emotion. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you're saying, well, but it's facts, so it's propaganda. No, if it's facts, it's facts. It's not propaganda. But if it's facts plus emotion, it's propaganda. Yeah. That's also a good distinction. I also just love this community for the rigor. You know, that in the chat, is there a working definition of propaganda? Let's agree on our terminology. I love it. Um, Going back to the question of, of, I guess, the emotional ingredient that makes propaganda propaganda, someone has asked another really interesting question that strikes at the core of what makes propaganda powerful, which is emotion. And this person is asking um, this sort of distinction between using shame to motivate action versus using inspiration to motivate action. Which is more effective? I, I think that's one aspect of this question, and and then maybe going back to the question of ethics, you know, which is preferable. The uh, Mad Men advertising uh, age, like the whole idea of PR and using imagery and information to convey and sway people into adopting new um, uh, new mindsets and new habits. That's what I was looking for, new habits, use both inspiration and shame. So for example, in the beginning when they had cars, no one wanted to drive them. First they stank, they were dangerous, they were expensive, 
and everybody biked around. They didn't really need those cars, okay? It was far better to bike around than having this expensive clunky car that was very hard to maneuver and really smelled horrible and was loud and it, it wasn't a popular item. And the way that they were able to infiltrate culture and really have people adopt those cards was through the mix between inspiration and, and shame. And the shaming part that they used, and there's a whole podcast about that, I have to find it and include it into resources because I find that so fascinating, is that they shamed mothers for letting their sons drive bikes because they had a higher um, rate of being killed by an automobile. Shame on the mothers for letting their sons, okay? And all of the ads that they were using were shame, shame on, uh, um, basically, your mother should be ashamed of you, you know, putting yourself in danger by driving this bike when you could be safe in a car. Meanwhile, that's not a fact, okay? The, there are more chances of us getting killed by a car, even today, than catching COVID, just so you know, okay? There's a higher probability to die in a car accident than to catching COVID, COVID and dying. But we're not talking about that, right? Because the automotive industry is such a powerful lobby. So that's the use of shame and inspiration. And through inspiration, product placement in movies, this idea of a car is a sexy woman that the men can enter and all these things. So it's, it's a mix of both. In the case of climate, I think we should also have a mix of both <laughs> because we've seen just the shaming, shaming, shaming. There's no inspiration in trying to be green, really. What do you do? What do you get from a from a you know a vulgar mass media perspective? Nothing. Yeah, you're just asked to sacrifice and give up things that you've been trained all your life through propaganda to desire. So that I, I agree with you. There does have to be a little bit of a shaming component because you know, counteracting decades of brainwashing toward the consumerism side. Um, there's, there is no self-interest in giving up our consumption habits. Um, and also just as someone who comes from Korean culture, shame is a really important part of our, of our culture and our, mo you know, our sort, it's one of our tools as parents to, uh, get people to do the right thing, you know, and it's not always great, but sometimes it works really, really well. Um, so I think one of the themes that's kind of coming out in your talk and also in the question is this idea of reframing and maybe even using some positive propaganda methods to reframe things in a way that helps us all change to protect our people and planet. Um, and one of the questions in our Q&A box is, um, you know, do we have any recommendations for changing the the words and maybe the way that we think about things like soil and water like right now we think about soil and water um, and even land we talk about them as resources you know natural resources and um this uh student is very astutely pointing out that that framing is it comes from a colonial mindset um, so they are asking for uh, some ideas for how to reframe it and, and maybe some different language for talking about resources. About resources, right? In the Natural book, resources, yeah, like soil and water. In the book, Colonialism is uh, pollu uh, Pollution, sorry, is Colonialism, Dr. Max Libaron talks a lot about land with a capital L, resources with a capital R, and uh, uh, how it was basically, we have to check ourselves, you know, deeply, like me too, like even simple things. I am battling my own internalized colonialism daily on so many ideas that I, I don't even realize I have in my mind, you know. Um, but this idea of extraction, of extracting land, of using land as, as though it was given to me to extract from, that I don't owe it nothing that you know, all these notions uh, are, are deeply ingrained in the way that we were taught about how you know, to create anything that we need to eat, to create products, to everything that we, that we use essentially comes from the land, comes from nature. 
So um, it's 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 a battle of paradigms, right? It's a, it's really about unlearning a lot of notions that we must identify that we're wrong at the at the at the heart of them, and really figuring out how we can properly unlearn them, creating new paradigms. And you know, John, this is the this is the invitation here. This is the invitation as part of Open EDU to figure this out together. Like I'm, I'm not saying we know. Yeah, this we is the it is the work. Question: We want to. This is the work. Yeah, it's, it's the work. Uh, and again, regarding resources and land, um, we are trained to think in extract with an extractivist mindset. You know, out of survival, assimilation. You can. It's not. You know. I'm not saying that to, to to stop us with guilt, but I'm saying that to identify even in our own culture, <clears throat> in the global majority, there's a lot of internalized colonialism we battle with that separates us from one another because there's not a common language and to also separates us from progress because we just don't know what's blocking us. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to build on that. Um, I read in... Um a book called We Are the Poors. I can't remember the author's name at this moment, but the title is definitely We Are the Poors. And I believe the author is South African. Uh, but that author, um, not sure if they coined this or got it from someone else, but that author spoke about these kind of common things like soil and water and so forth as the commons. And I really loved that word to describe what we now use, you know, refer to as resources, because then it kind of creates this understanding that we're all responsible for it. And on the point <clears throat> that you just made about all of us being responsible in a way for working through this together, there's just a really interesting side conversation happening in the chat right now that I want to pull into the main conversation regarding the use of shame. So, um, we are being challenged as purveyors of shame <laughs> in a really positive way. I think that they are talking about how, how shame um, perpetuates oppression um, and that maybe there is uh, a way that we can look at um, the key as transcending the need. Is there a way that we can help people understand and transcend the need for consumption rather than shaming. Um, and then another sort of part of this side conversation is um, someone is asking, you know, <clears throat> do we really want to rely on shame or do we want to think of it as accountability? Um, because I think shame is bringing up a lot of negativity for people. Um, and I understand why. And I just want to also offer that as you know, even in this moment, collectively, okay, let's reframe that and together. 100%, like if you know our work, we definitely have never used shame in our work because we find shame, we agree, is a, is a tool of oppression. Uh, in Arabic culture, we do use shame <laughs> and shaming is key. Um, it's contradictory. I, I would like to invite everyone to embrace contradiction and to not to be so certain because certainty is also a colonial mindset. So embracing contradiction and being able to fluidly understand what is needed to use shame on and what isn't, it's a case by case scenario. There isn't a standardized answer to be like, we don't use shame, we use shame. Um, we have used shame sometimes and then immediately our community would be like, you're shaming the wrong people. You should shame the institutions, yes. And then we see how Greta Thunberg is shaming the institutions and shaming uh, uh, governments and shaming left and right, everything and everyone. And is that effective? I wonder. Um, I don't have an answer regarding uh, shame, but I would like to invite the, the uh, to expand our mind, to have an elastic mind. And if you are interested in this notion, look it up, elasticity of the mind or elastic mind and to embrace contradiction, in fact, because it's not, Sometimes maybe it will work with shame. Sometimes it will work with uh, kindness. Sometimes it will work with inspiration. It, there, there's not a, a, it's not a recipe. <laughs> we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, two really interested questions that I think go together as a pair. 
One is, <laughs> this is a great question. How do I unbrainwash myself? And the second question is, how can we, I guess, collectively move away from this carefree ideal um, in our dominant culture that promotes not caring and, you know, being free and individualistic? Um, you know, what kind of collective or community tools do we know of that work in the exact opposite way of disposability? So how do we unbrainwash ourselves? And then also, how can we move away from carefree, hyper-individualistic and free, like that's our definition of freedom, to uh, something more community and collective oriented? Great question. Oh my goodness. Um, how to un-brainwash ourselves, move to the global south. <laughs> <laughs> With an idea of not going there to save everyone, but to be of service. Um, read books that are not written by Americans. Uh, no offense. Um, watch movies that are foreign and read the subtitles if you can. <laughs> um, I would say exit your, put yourself voluntarily in, in a cultural shock, you know, like invite yourself to exit your comfort as much as possible. Choose this comfort when it comes to the mindset as much as possible. And I know this sounds very controversial to be like, choose discomfort over comfort, but most of the time it's a good idea, <laughs> but it's not always a good idea. For example, if you are a war survivor, I'm gonna say choose comfort because you don't have that. But if, you, for example, I don't know, I, I can't give a blanket statement. I, I would like to be, you know, careful here but I read things that are not part of your culture um, learn another language if you have the ability um, can I just build on that yeah. I think there's something we can also do internally which is to be super present to practice mindfulness and observe your own mind and if you can kind of interrupt the you know desires will arise because we are brainwashed but if you can interrupt the process of that desire to consumption cycle then i think you've done something really powerful to not just unbrainwash yourself but to defeat the propaganda that's killing our planet and exploiting our fellow people i was going to say meditation but i i wanted to say it with a with a big understanding that it is something that isn't coming from the American culture. And so when I say something like this, it may sound like, oh, go ahead and appropriate someone else's culture, but get in tune with your spirituality. Understand that you are not just your body. You are also a spirit. You are, get in touch with your spirituality in any way that makes sense to you. Because also what we are seeing and in other classes we have taught is that colonialism has separated spirituality from any other uh, field of study. Science, uh, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, everything. It has extracted spirit from it. And that is an artificial way of thinking because we, we are not able to do that at all. So it's fake, so it's not possible. So again, just to riff off on John Wan's idea of being practicing mindfulness, being in tune with our spirits as much as possible. It can be through sport, it can be through psychedelics, it can be through meditation, it can be through traveling, it can be through planting, it can be, there's many roads that lead us to being in touch with our spirit. I just wanna do a time check. We're about uh, almost 15 minutes over um, and we still have several hundred people in the class. Um, and this is such an amazing discussion. We um, are not gonna be able to get to all of these questions. There are 35 open questions, but I would like to ask someone from um, our Slow Factory team to copy uh, the questions and keep them somewhere because they are so deep. Um, and I think many of these questions we could perhaps address later on in either articles or maybe even on you know social media posts or something like that or future classes even um so yes if someone um could 
grab those questions and record them or paste them somewhere, that would be amazing. Um, Celine, do you want to offer, do you want to answer one more question before we sort of the chat and I, I love that people disagree with me when I said um, don't read American books I mean read American books for sure but also read other books how many books do you read a year if it's two then one of them should not be an American book that's what I mean and uh, if you if you really can't uh, see the benefit behind this idea is to inspire internationalism we are already bombarded by American culture it is everywhere around the world and our culture, the culture of this global majority that we call BIPOC, and now we are trying to redefine as the global majority, is a misunderstood culture. It's highly dominated by identity politics. It's dominated by performance. And I don't want to engage in that. And I would like to invite nuance. And I would like to invite thoughts over certainty and questioning over certainty and embracing contradictions and being fluid in that mindset and embracing this idea of the elastic mind rather than being certain and giving you an ABC checklist of what you must do. That was what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I you know, there's someone in the chat who has really brought that idea um, out even more by just reminding us that American culture also is not a monolith and there are so many American uh, cultures within America that are based in diaspora, but they are also uniquely American. Um, and that what I think this class is really talking about is a sort of mainstream, you know, hegemonic American culture, you know, the kind that's very, very commercial and that's been exported around the world. Uh, but that is a really good reminder from um, our student, Divya, thank you so much. That's a great, yeah. This book consumed when it comes out. Yes. <laughs> Aja Barber is also very busy in the chat. I just want you to know we have a sustainability uh, thought leader in our midst, um, you know, sparking off all kinds of conversations in the chat. Um, but please look for her book. And um, if you enjoyed this class, if you've enjoyed any of the Open EDU classes, I really encourage you to support us in whatever way you can. If you are able to donate to support this ongoing free and open um, education series that is, you know, really unique in that it centers perspectives of the global south and, um, you know, centers instructors. Uh, who are also of the global majority, um, you know, I would encourage you to please go to our website, uh, Slow Factory Foundation and uh, .org, I think, and to um, donate. And if you participate in Slow Factory classes regularly throughout the year, please consider becoming a monthly donor, you know, even if it's a smaller amount, but you sign on for regular donations throughout the year that actually is an incredible help to small organizations like ours a sort of steady stream of um, of support is uh, you know a lot easier for easier for us to plan around than a surge of support um, although we do love a surge of support too um, and also uh, if you are not able to donate um, to please, uh, you can still help us by sharing the open EDU classes and programs, letting other people know how much you've learned um, in these various series, uh, you know, tweeting, posting, sharing links with your networks, um, etc. And again, of course, thank you so much to our partner Vestiaire Collective for helping us um, bring this um, summer session to you without any cost to our students. And a huge thank you to all of the students who brought such deep conversation to the chat and to the Q&A session. Um, you all are really, really thoughtful. This is a, you know, learning is happening in all directions here. Um, so we will be sure to record the chat and take a deeper look at what you've put in there. Thank Any you. Any parting so words, Celine? Yes, thank you all so much. I love the chat. I love the chat so much. I wish I could have this chat every day and chat every day with all of you. It's so fun to read. And again, when I mean by American, it's not the Americas. And also it's this, it's the colonial agenda of the Estados Unidos, okay, that we are living in. Um, occupied land, occupied territory. 
uh, and I am here as well as John once said on occupied Lenape Hawking. And that's what I mean by America, of course. Um, so of course, you know, you know what I mean, if you know what I mean. And uh, <laughs> thank you all so much. This has been such a great um, conversation. I feel like the questions in the Q&A deserve another round. And for that, the fourth class part of Open EDU summer program is a, a sort of a ask us anything. So if we didn't answer your questions, we invite you to join us. The very last class, I think it's the um, uh, August 20th, I believe, or something like that. Uh, check our website for the, 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 the date. Adja, myself, Liz, and uh, Best Year Collective will be here. August 27, thank you so much, Adja. We will be here answering all your questions. So if we didn't end up answering them in today's class or in the previous class, please keep them in mind. And we are also recording some of the questions that we would like to keep um, uh, for the last round called Ask Us Anything. It's like a town hall. We invite you all to join us. We're going to be able also to open up if you raise your hand to bring you on video so we can be having a conversation with you all. So August 27th, Ask Us Anything. And remember, if you do want to continue this super lively conversation to head over to our Slack, um, you know, we really want to keep our conversation going outside of the Instagram platform and, you know, just help people to connect in community um, as much as possible on Slack. So please head over to the Slack to continue this conversation. And if someone from our team could drop that link one more time in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, the, the, the Slack channel is there. Um, join us. Let's continue debating what is America. I love this. Mm -hmm. Be opposed to what is America. What do we consider American? Why do we want to be American? Do we want to be American? <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's a it's debate and it's also dialogue and it's just it's just so fertile and creative. And I just I love the way that everyone is building together. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And join us on Slack and see you soon.